So what I want to do is I want to introduce vector fields by some common things we might already have a little intuition about. So if we consider a, a, a river, what we know is a river has moving water in it, and the moving water can be graphed by, or at least shown by these oriented uh, uh, vectors. And when you walk in a river, you know on the edges of the river that the water does not move as quick as it does in the center of the river. And that's why these vectors are a little shorter on the edges of the river, and they're longer in the middle. Uh, you know, the length of the magnitude uh, describing, you know, the, the speed of that particular water. If you look at an explosion, what happens with an explosion in the beginning, there's a lot of energy. So it might move a little quicker outwards, closer to the center of the explosion, and it dissipates as you go further out from the, from the explosion. And then the reverse idea is, is gravity, that, you know, near the object, there's more gravity than there is further away from the object. So, you know, the vectors are longer here, and they're a little shorter over here. So the next thing I want to do is I want to define what a, what a vector field function is and then, and then grab it, graph it on the xy plane. Even though it's tedious, it's, it's still possible. A vector field on the domain assigns a vector to each point in the domain. A general form vector field in three dimensions is given by, by this formula. So our vector field f defined on x, y, z is a function on x, y, z, i, n of x, y, z, j, and p of x, y, z, k. So what it does is it defines a function for each coordinate. So for all the x coordinates, it's this function. For all the y coordinates, it's the n function. And for all the of, uh, of, you know, the original domain. So we really could just write m, i, plus n, j, plus q, p, k, knowing that m, n, and p are, are, are functions defined on this domain. Uh, in two dimensions, f of x comma y is just m, i, plus n, j where M and N are now just going to be uh, functions defined on the x y plane. How to graph a vector field. So when I want to graph this vector field, I want to do it for integer values um, from, and you can make these things larger, but uh, I did claim that this is a little tedious, so we don't have to do it for everything. But some books might ask you to go from minus 10 to 10, minus 10 to 10 will take a little bit. But if you can do it from minus 2 to 2 and minus 2 to 2, you can do it. You can do it for any size. So I'm going to give you a, a basic uh, a vector field, and this is just uh, for simplicity, x, i plus y, j. So what I want to do is I want to graph this thing for particular points here, and I put dots for all those integer values. So say I want to do this dot right here. This is, you know, the, uh, the coordinate 1, comma 1. So what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to find this vector function at 1, comma 1, which means x is 1 and y is 1, so this is 1, i plus 1j, and if you graph the vector 1 comma 1 at that point, x is going to move 1 in the, uh, in the x direction, and then move also 1 in the y direction, so it's going to look like that. If I want to graph the point, say, here, this is going to be x is 0, y is 2, so f of 0 comma 2, x is going to be 0, and y is going to be 2, so 0i plus, plus 2j, so it's only going to move two units of the j at that particular um, dot. If I want to do, say, this point over here, x is negative 2, y is going to be negative 1. So f of x is negative 2, y is negative 1. So x being negative 2, y being 1, we can see that this is negative 2 in the x, 1 in the y. So negative 2 in the x, negative 1 in the y. So it's going to look like Uh, let's do one more. How about down here? Let's say x is 1, y is negative 2. So x is going to be 1, y is going to be negative 2. So 1, i, uh, minus 2, j. So 1 in the x, negative 2 in the, in the y. So it's going to look like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to graph a bunch of uh, more vectors on here and fill out this curve to save some time. So when I filled out all the, all the vectors for this vector field, we see that it looks more like that explosion curve, except well, not curve, but, but field. And uh, it's a little slower in the beginning. You notice around this point, 0, comma 0, which would just be 0, uh, 0 for the vector. But close to 0, 0, the vectors are a little shorter. And then the farther away, they're getting a little bigger. So you can see that this is like uh, this is increasing as you get farther away. 
might actually kind of define like the expansion of the universe. We know that things are moving faster as they go farther away, which is which is kind of interesting in physics. Uh, one more uh, example. I will do just a couple and, and show you a different vector field. So here's our next uh, vector field I want to graph. And this one is going to have a little bit different orientation than the previous one, and we'll just kind of get right to work on it. So let's try, say, the, 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 the point 1, comma 1. So if I want to figure out what vector lives at 1, comma 1, I have to do x is 1, y is 1. So this is going to be y being 1, x also being uh, 1, all over the square root of 1 squared plus that uh, 1 squared. So we're going to get minus 1 uh, i plus 1 j all over the square root of 2. So minus 1 over root 2 i plus 1 over root 2 j. And graphing it, it would be helpful if I could find its length. And my claim is that all these vectors are going to have length 1 because of what this denominator is. So I just want to do a quick check. Let's check its length. So... Uh, uh, its length is going to be equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So minus 1 over root 2 squared plus uh, 1 over root 2 squared. So this is the square root of 1 half plus 1 half, which is the square root of 1, which is 1. So it does, it does have length 1. So it's going to move uh, negative in the x, positive in the y at the same uh, length, but it, and total length is going to be 1. So you'll see that it looks like this. If I want to figure out, say, the, uh, uh, the value at, um, let me erase this, try another one. How about at this point right here, let's say uh, 2 comma 0, sorry, 0 comma 2. So I know x is equal to 0, y is equal to 2, so that y being 2, x being 0, all over the square root of x, which is 0 squared, plus that um, plus that 2 squared. So this is going to be, the denominator is going to be 2. This is going to be minus 2i plus 0j all over 2. So this is minus i plus 0j. You can see that it moves this direction again with length 1. Let's do maybe one more. Let's try, um, let's try negative 1, uh, comma 1, and uh, yeah, that, that'd be enough. That'll fill out the rest of it. You don't need to see how to do this. So if I want um, at x is negative 1, y is negative 1, this is going to be a minus minus 1i plus a negative 1 squared plus minus 1 squared. So it's also going to be over root 2. So I have a 1i minus 1j all over root 2. So it's going to have the exact same length of 1 here. But you can see that we are moving uh, positive in the x direction and negative in the y direction. So we are looking like this. So I'll fill out the rest of the, these points and, and show you that this is your classic circulation curve. So you're going to have this this, uh, this spiral-looking thing. And um, all these magnitudes are going to be really important. So fill it out the curve and we can see this. The whole point of, uh, of, of drawing these vector fields is to see what it's eventually going to do to points when you put them in there. So if I drop like a point, like a, a particle in here, what's going to happen to that particle? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to, you know, it's going to spin around with all that particle. As opposed to when we put a particle in the river, it's just going to slide it down the river. And we'll talk about, you know, the work done by these fields in, in, the, in the next lecture. So what I want to do is I want to create a vector field. And one of the most common vector fields that we have to create is what's called a gradient field. And uh, I'll define it and I'll draw it and then we'll do a couple examples. Gradient field. The gradient field of a differentiable function f of x comma y comma z is considered the gradient of f, which is the partial derivative of f with respect to x in the i direction, partial derivative of f with respect to y in the j direction, the partial derivative of f with respect to z in the, uh, in the z direction. So consider a parachute. We have this parachute, and we know that when we're actually uh, uh, going 
going down in a parachute that the wind is coming up to this thing and it's slowing down the wind. And the way the wind actually moves through this para parachute is perpendicular to the parachute. So you can see that the wind coming through it is going to look like, like this. You can think of a parachute really as a filter kind of slowing that wind down. And all these vectors are moving perpendicular to, you know, this, this, this parachute, which, you know, has this three-dimensional orientation. And we can see that all of these vectors are going to be moving, you know, perpendicular to this, this parachute. The drawing in the middle is going to be challenging, but to get an idea of what's going on. So all perpendicular to this parachute. So our job is to be able to find, you know, the gradient of F is, is what we're going to do. So I have a couple examples finding the gradients. So I want to determine the gradient field of this function f of x comma y comma z, where, where this is our function f of x, y, z. So the multiplication of x, y, and z. So the gradient of f is going to be the partial derivative with respect to xi plus the partial derivative with respect to y uh, uh, j plus the partial derivative with respect to, to z and k. So really filling these out. So the derivative with respect to x of this, the partial derivative with respect to x is going to be, well, y and z are constants. The derivative of x is going to be 1. So this is going to be y and z. Uh, the partial derivative of this function with respect to y means x and z are constants, and the derivative of y is 1. So you're just going to be left with the constants. And then similarly, the partial derivative with respect to z, x and y are constants, so the derivative of z we get a 1. So this is going to be equal to x, y. So we have, uh, this is our, this is our, our gradient function. Uh, next, uh, we can have something that looks like f of x comma y comma z being equal to, say, the natural log of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If I want to take the gradient of this thing, we know that the gradient of f is going to be the partial derivative with respect to x. Well, the, the, the derivative of the natural log of, you know, of an expression is going to be 1 over that expression multiplied by the, well, the derivative of what's inside. The derivative with respect to x of what's inside is going to be 2x. And that's going to be, you know, that's going to be for your i component. Simply for the j component, it's going to be, 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared. I still have to multiply by the derivative of what's inside with respect to, to y. So this is going to be 2y. That's going to be in a j. And then uh, plus the partial derivative of this thing with respect to z. So it's going to be 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared times the derivative with respect to, to z still. And that's going to be our k. So our gradient function in 2x all over x squared plus y squared plus z squared i plus 2y over x squared plus y squared plus z squared and that's j plus 2z all over x squared plus y squared plus z squared and we